Over to you. Thank you so much for that one. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon, UX family. This is such an honor to be here with you this afternoon, and I thank you so much for your time and lending your ear. Um, I'm going to tell you a story this afternoon. Let's call it a bedtime story, seeing that this is the last talk of the afternoon. This is my story. I invite all of you to please comment on the side, your experience, if any, during the session, as well as post questions you might have. If you feel that you're shy or you think your questions are silly or not good enough, then I want you to pose it even more because there's no such thing as a silly question and I'd really love to hear from you. So my story begins with once upon a time, not so long ago, when the world was buzzing with movement, sounds of traffic, movies coming up on the big screen and people basically forming groups with friends to go and watch it and have a lovely evening out. A time when we had freedom of movement, freedom to hug those we loved, shake hands, see each other, smile basically, or frown, um, and just be human. This was a time we took for granted, as little did we know, like you know, that all of this would be stripped from us as soon, without much warning or time to prepare, but we had to go with it and adapt and move forward. Being a human race that has survived up to now and still going, we adapted, but this meant that our environment and the way in which we did things had to drastically change, and it had to change fast. But it didn't just have to change because we had to, and that we were forced to, it had to change to ensure that we survived, right? This is known on Google as 2020, when you go and Google it, 2020, the year the world stopped. Everything went quiet, people stayed indoors. It was eerie. It was weird and scary. Introverts loved it. Extroverts, like myself, suffered, okay, and are still suffering to today. <laughs> I'm talking about the COVID-19 pandemic that inhaled the earth in less than a few weeks, bringing everything to a standstill. No movement, no face-to-face -face meetings, no handshakes, and no hugs. Now, as a UX researcher and someone who rely on feedback on products and features, be it interviews in person or remote, moderated and unmoderated studies, online research and questionnaires, to name just a few, because the list is very long, um, I was one of those who suffered in my role as a UX researcher, right? Being used to and loved human interaction, I found it extremely stressful to now, all of a sudden, find a way to still do my job as effectively and at the speed I used to while still locked up at home. So the question from Is it just me or um, has the dial frozen? Can anybody hear me? At this whole remote thing. Can you hear me? Hey, Dal. Yeah, okay. yeah, it was. It was you, you can, uh, you froze there for about 10 seconds. I know. I know. <laughs> okay, so where did you last end up hearing me? I think it, I think it should be okay um, if you okay. continue. Yeah. No, not a problem. So just for to track back a little bit, um, I was saying that I was one of those who suffered in my role as a UX researcher. Uh, being used to and loved human interaction, I found it extremely stressful, basically, to now all of a sudden find a way to still do my job as effectively and at the speed I used to do it while sitting locked up at home, right? All of us, basically. So my question to everybody on here today is on the chat, type a brief note from a UX point of view on what you dealt with with the lockdown and restrictions and what you did to overcome this and do what you do effectively or even more effectively. So what did you learn? What did you improve on? What new ways of working basically did you put in place for yourself during this time? So while you type away and let me tell you, I'm going to tell you, um, let me tell you a little bit of what about a what a UX researcher is basically in a nutshell. Okay. So what is UX research? Before we go into that, UX researchers are individuals that has a passion for people. Not just that, but they are individuals that's got a passion for people, right? They have empathy and know how to build rapport with users during usability studies as well. They get silly excited to watch people do things um, and they basically meticulously observe how people do it. Okay? 
of many things. They work closely with UX teams and stakeholders to design and conduct usability studies with the aim of, improve, of improving, I apologize, to pr uh, products or software or even experiences. Would you want to be a UX researcher after I mentioned all of this? If you are already a UX researcher, please do comment that on the side. I'd like to see how many of us are here today. And if you would like to become a UX researcher or are interested in the field, also comment on the side or post a question. I'd like to hear from you. So on the Nielsen Norman, Nielsen Norman Group has a beautiful little summary for us on this. So please don't think that UX researchers only speak to users face to face. It's, it's not the case, okay? It's an exciting field to be in. The impact that you have as a UX researcher and the impact that you can make within a company or brand really is something to get excited about. It's fun, it's exciting and challenging, and you meet so many cool new people along the way as well. So to get back to this whole pandemic that rocked my world as a UX researcher and other like others alike as well, I used to I was used to conducting studies in um, moderated in person. So we used to call people into the office, set up a boardroom, and sit the person down, meet with them, and have this face to face conversation. Right? I was used to be able to see the user sitting in front of me. I was used to observe their their behaviors and what they say and how they say it as well. I could closely watch facial expressions, which is one of the very important things. Eye movement, hand gestures, blinking and swallowing, feet crossing or tapping if a person gets annoyed, um, sitting forward, engaging or sliding back into their chair, basically crossing their arms and disconnecting from the session. And I would quickly react, I would be able to actually quickly, quickly react um, we needed to either comfort the user or bring them back on track and pull them into the conversation and focusing, just get them focusing again on what we're obviously doing, right? When doing interviews or studies, my aim was always to let the participant or the respondent or the customer or the client leave the room in a better mood than what they came in with. So I was always upbeat, always friendly. It's always easy to get somebody to smile. And I was happy and I really loved working with people and doing this. And just like that, the world went into isolation and the in-person studies unfortunately stopped. Okay. All of a sudden, I was stuck at home, staring at a computer screen and typing messages and emails all day, sometimes not saying a physical word to someone, but writing messages. Attending online meetings, which was really weird and absolutely messy in the beginning, and honestly, it still is, and I may think many of you can still nod along, um, that personal touch, was no more. We completely lost that. Well, it was pushed to the side for some time. No more observing while well navigating difficult conversations, seeing users' way of thinking and their physical and emotional behavior couldn't be observed as effectively. All the things we as UX researchers rely on heavily to get great insights from an interview was paused and we had to resort to alternatives. We had to replace it with something that was just as good or even better, but we struggled to find the answer to what exactly the solution would be. My first big challenge was with participants, basically, to recruit participants and to find a way to get to those users who are not tech savvy. Those who do not have internet access or stable internet connection, those who do not have smartphones or a computer, we were at risk of missing out on that very important custom base. Those users who do not have access to all these sticky things, the lower income bracket people or the elderly who struggle to use WhatsApp but let alone navigate the meeting app and prototype by themselves. Our findings will be skewed if we couldn't solve for this issue. You might say it's easy to pick up a phone and call someone, right? Yeah, it's easy to do. But it's not so easy to build rapport with this person over the phone. You can't see their facial expressions. You can't read the room. You can't see how they interact with your product. And you can't be on top of it like you were previously. You are completely blind, absolutely completely blind. And it's a horrific thing to think of. They have weird distractions going on in the back. And you have to work extra hard to get them engaged again. Or they forget where they were. Oh, and I have so many stories actually to tell about that. The one funny one that I quickly want to drop here was that the person, a, a female lady that I chatted to, she's a uh, business owner as well. She was at home at that stage. And she thought, she told me, please, can I just have a moment with you? And she paused herself and muted herself. She still thinks she was on mute. And she proceeded to yell at the person in the other room who I think actually asked her something that he can get the toilet paper himself. 
on at the top of the lungs, literally at the top of the lungs. I was in stitches, okay? I was literally lying on the floor. And then she came back, unmuted herself when she thought, and she just proceeded with her calm and like she did. She just proceeded calmly, and I had to keep my cool. But literally just breaking inside, wanting to laugh because I heard her literally scream. Being a mom, just being a human for that split second on the other side and seeing what a day in the life of her home would be. So it's, it's those type of reactions or um, interferences basically that made it a little bit funny, I must say. I couldn't observe like I used to. I took to social media as well as Google to see how many others are dealing with this issue that we've got of dealing remotely with our customers and interviewing remotely and how do others do it okay many said that they use online remote software it's easy just to quickly go and down an online remote software piece of work basically but the problem is if products are blocked on your organization like myself i work for a bank um you're stuck you are completely stuck you can only use what the organization allows you to use so others sat with the same issue and was also asking questions with very little answers online. It was absolutely chaos. I was frantically searching for answers. I ended up resorting to what we usually use in our organization, which is Microsoft Teams calls. The interruptions there would be bad network quality, for instance. So you'd be halfway like what happened now, and I'd be stuck on your screen with a funny facial expression, probably. And then 10 seconds later, the video would catch up. That's so annoying. Recorded telephone calls. I have telephone software that I do recordings on. The problems there with inter um, interruptions, basically, or the respondent would be driving when I call him. He wouldn't take the, the interview as seriously as it would have been if it was an in-person meeting. Okay? And he, which resulted in me having to reschedule this interview, which pushed out deadlines. And it's got a knock-on effect with everything. It's got a knock-on effect with, with feedback and findings feedback. It's got a knock-on effect with the UX things that now has to go and implement the feedback that you gather. So things got pushed out because of all of this. When you ask someone if you can call them from a bank, <laughs> they think it's a scam. Well, fair, okay. Um, and they would contact the bank actually very stressed. I lost a few customers or a few users this way, even after sending them an email from my organizational email address with my email signature at the bottom as well. Um, and they just said, no, sorry, you know what, I don't want to take part. Understandably, they just didn't feel safe enough and I didn't. they didn't want to take part in, so they didn't want to chat to me. Sending out emails and surveys, hoping people would respond to those now that they have more time. Previously, we've got massive issues with the qualitative, quantitative, the um, quantity, the amount of those surveys that basically goes out, not the qualitative. Um, the, the survey completion amount would be very low. You'll send it out to 100 emails, and out of 100, maybe three would complete it. Ten would open it up, three would complete it. And I thought, you know what, now that everybody's at home, maybe they'll do that. No, not the case, still not the case. So that curse hasn't been lifted. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. So I don't want to sound all doomy and gloomy here. On the positive side, we started to get a wider reach of customers across the continent. Me sitting in Randburg, Joburg, Johannesburg, we used to get people that's close enough that can, that can basically travel to the office, travel to the place where we need to meet with them. So what happened now, because we've, we've got access to phone calls to remote teams, for instance, I got access to people sitting in Cape Town, um, jumping from that meeting to somebody that sits in Namibia, somebody that sits in Botswana, all of a sudden I could go into the rest of Africa and do interviews there as well and get feedback from them also. So it's very interesting that, that you actually, by losing one very important part, you gain something else that actually opens up your world a little bit more as well. And it's amazing and stressful at the same time also. So something, get, getting to my presentation here, so something amazing started to happen to me. I started to focus on listening in interviews more. Not that I didn't listen before, but I started on focusing, putting my block out, my noise reduction, earphones and all of that on, and getting a quiet space, and literally just focusing on listening. And I'm not talking about just listening to what they say, listening to all the cues in the back as well. I started to develop my own way of building report with users over a phone call and getting them to engage and keeping that engagement while on the call so that I can listen basically to those little cues, like I said, because I can't see them. And for those I could see, those that put their actual camera on for teams, you know, their head and shoulders shot, 
but you can only see their head and shoulders and not their feet and their hands to read full body language. I grew into completing the picture in my mind. So based on how the user is sitting, when they do shuffle around, you can basically gauge by are they tapping their feet, maybe tapping their feet, or are they moving around quite a lot. It started. To, I started to develop those senses. It started to become second nature to my brain to complete the picture. I started to listen more and just watch and ask questions. My approach as a UX researcher was changing. My research study design adopted listening skills and principles, and I started to apply and develop different methodologies in research and design that also matched the environment and situation rather than just the study itself. I got so much more out of the studies than before, but it also took longer sometimes to get through the remote session like I previously mentioned. I found myself approaching planning and designing a study differently when I set, set up my test plans. So the column I used to have, the one column I used to have where I ticked the little box if the user passed or failed in activity was now split into four columns and it's still growing to this day. The task completion rate box was there, but then I added a how they sounded while navigating the prototype or answering the questions. I added a background noise from the user that indicate uncomfortableness, shifting, and disengaging. I started mapping emotions to the questions, learning even more how to ask effective questions and being able to predict the possible answers or reactions and testing these predictions against findings. Some elements in my study packs disappeared and new ones was added, then progressed through these studies and learned as we went along with this new way of working, the word I absolutely hate. Okay? While being blind, I could start to hear when someone is smiling. I could start to hear when someone is thinking. I could start to hear when somebody is starting to get annoyed, when somebody is starting to get bored. It actually happened yesterday when somebody was actually sitting and yawning right in front of me. Okay? So now I could quickly react to these expressions, making use of my tone of voice, which I've been using all the time here to keep you engaged. So where I previously mainly used my body language or facial expressions along with the tone in an in-person study, I learned to animate my voice in such a way that the user will come back to the conversation or engage even better. Now there's a fine line between sounding fake and sounding real. The secret is being real, that's the secret. And it takes a lot of effort and energy to maintain this level of excitement throughout the day. Imagine doing this for four to five studies, starting at nine, ending at four. It is exhausting, but it works. Now using tone of voice effectively to get a user to engage and react and work with you takes time and practice to do as well. It's like tennis, I call it a game of tennis. You have to serve, and depending on how the other person decide, receives sorry, the ball and sends it back to you, you have to quickly shift and adapt to the tone to make sure that you don't drop the ball. It also depends, or it also doesn't help if you don't take into account how the user receives your tone and will just be put off by you being overly excited, um, or the fact that you just sound so monotone and dare to like they just literally want to crawl under a bridge and go and, and hide from you. Okay. So you have to read the room. But when I say read the room, you have to listen. It's, it's so much more work that gets piled on top of your shoulders other than some, taking notes and already listening or watching and observing and all of that. Now you have to listen to these subtle cues and be able to act upon it swiftly by changing your strategy quickly by using these, these skills that you've gained throughout. These it's natural skills that you build on, that you learn from as well. So you have to adapt accordingly um, all the time while listening for feedback and cues. And you have to do all of this, like I said, while nearly completely blindfolded. It's interesting how we adapt to our surroundings and learn new skills and apply them in our work and personal life as well. When one thing you heavily relied on for so long immediately gets taken away from you like losing a limb um, and you have your challenge basically to think outside the box and use what you have at your disposal things really do get interesting this pandemic has taught me so much and i hope that you're also able to take away the positive learnings from this from this entire experience basically and use it to your advantage and to get to a positive outcome and at the end use it basically in every research study so thank you for your time, and please do ask questions on the site. 
Thank you so much for that talk at all. Um, there was a question, but there's also been tons of comments. I think that's been uh, in line with what you've been saying and validating some of the um, the comments. So there's been an interesting discussion in the comments. Um, but I'm going to ask everyone if they do have any questions to po please post them in the ask a question section uh, or component. Um, yeah, the, um, I mean, as you can see, there's just tons of of co yeah. like positive comments. One that I see, can I comment on one? Sure. Okay, fantastic. One that I see here is um, from, it looks like Clara, you back. I've observed a remote first time research conducting, um, first time researchers, sorry, conduct an interview uh, where, where you could actually hear the person playing fidget in the back the entire session because she has diagnosed anxiety. So it's things like that that you can pick up. What do you do with a person that's got diagnosed anxiety? Um, how do you approach that type of person? Like I said, you have to read the room and adapt your your approach to keep this person engaged and not freak them out anymore. So, yeah, very valid comment. I absolutely love that one. Thank you for that. We've got two questions. So the first one is by Anna. How would you go about understanding the user's environment remotely? So very good question. Hi, Anna. Thank you so much for that question. It's a very good question. Um, you can go both ways. One that I don't, you can either ask or you can observe, observe by listening. So by observing my listening, so one that I approach mostly is to sit and to listen if this person gets distracted or to ask them, are you comfortable? Are you ready to go? That's one thing that I also do. Um, and by then you can basically gauge, sometimes like what happened in a previous session as well, the person that didn't have coffee, I read earlier as well, load shedding caught somebody and they couldn't go and make tea. So what I do is I ask them, are you comfortable? I listen to if they are comfortable. Do they even have the seat? This is another thing. When we do go and, um, remote usability studies, you don't know what the other person's situation is. Do they even have a proper desk? Do they have their laptop or whatever on their, on their lap? Are they sitting on the floor or are they sitting at, at, in the kitchen? for instance. So you basically just listen out for that, listen for the cues and you adapt accordingly and make sure that the people are, or your respondent is um, comfortable at that stage. Be human. Thank you. I hope that answers the question, Anna. Um, we have another question by Yoke and that is, is there any, soft, any other software that you use to do remote usability testing with perhaps unmoderated testing tools? Unmoderated, I'm not a fan of unmoderated, unmoderated testing simply because of the type of usability test studies that we do. So it depends on the organization that you are in. Um, personally, myself, not a fan of that. Moderated usability testing, they stopped the one or they discontinued the one software piece that I absolutely love. It's got a gorilla. It was free as well. Um, and you can only do X amount of studies. I'm not even sure anymore because they stopped that. Um, that was, like I said, discontinued. Very, very sad. As the pandemic hit, they stopped that. So what I resort to at this stage is literally Microsoft Teams. That's the one that we rely on. It's the one that our organization approves on our systems. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we've got another three questions. How would you manage added anxiety or irritation from the participant with bad network connection when conducting the session? Keep calm. You just keep calm. But you can only keep calm for so long, right? You have to keep in mind that you've got another user scheduled after this one. So what I do, I give it a set amount of time. Um, I'm, I'm, I've got a lot of patience and empathy towards things like that as well. But if I see that it's coming to a point that it's really distracting and it's not working, I will literally just ask the respondent in a very fair way, would you mind if we reschedule the session to another day? And I've done this many times before, and it really does work. But as previously mentioned, it does push out your deadline dates of giving feedback and findings, and um, basically sitting in that session and, and giving your review findings back to your, your broader team. So you handle it as it comes. Thank you. Um, then we've got another question from Christopher. A challenge I found has been to ensure business or businesses maintain testing regime during COVID. May I ask, how have you substantiated the activity as a whole? 
say the beginning of the question again? As uh, sorry, a challenge I found has been to ensure businesses maintain testing regime during COVID. So how have you substantiated the activity as a whole? Um, that's also a very good question. Thank you for that one. Uh, I am lucky enough that the last two companies that I worked for, um, especially the one that I'm at now, we are very UX mature. The company really relies on the outside in approach and um, getting that customer first type view. And uh, we've got UX champions that basically runs with it. We've got managers and what we call imagineers, product owners, that sit at a higher level that would approach me first and say, we've got this idea or we've got these screens, we've got dream screens, for instance, will you test? So in that stage, I'm really, really lucky in the organization that I work in that they take it really seriously. Come hell or high water, they want us to test. Um, if I have to put myself in the shoes of somebody that's in a company or organization or somewhere where they do not have this champion, where they do not have this buy-in for user usability, or user research, put it that way, sorry, uh, I would still push it. I would prove my point to one study. Start small, don't go big, don't spend too much money, um, and prove the worth and build on that so that you can get the buy-in, so that you can get people to see. It's one thing to explain to them and, and that it, it's actually something that's needed. But the moment when you put a little bit of elbow grease in, even if it's with three respondents, and you can start to prove the value in that, I think you'll 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 start to actually build the UX maturity level in your company like that. I hope that Thank answered you. the question. Thank you. Uh, I hope that answered the question, Christopher. Uh, so that is the last of the questions. If there are any more questions.